Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Senator Kirsten Sinema quitting the Democratic Party and switching to independent. It's just after Democrats thought they won 51 seats in the Senate. What does it mean for the power balance next year? The investigation into possible collusion between the government and big tech to censor COVID information continues. A judge now rules that three high-ranking officials won't have to testify under oath. Arizona gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake says she is willing to take her election lawsuit all the way to the Supreme Court and is prepared for a long legal battle. Shadow banning of conservatives, blacklists, and a secret group for suppressing controversial accounts. All that and more in the eye-opening second Twitter Files installment. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema is leaving the Democratic Party and registering as an independent. It's shaking up the Senate just days after Democrats pick up a 51-49 majority. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema made a big announcement Thursday on CNN. I've registered as an Arizona independent. I know some people might be a little bit surprised by this, but actually I think it makes a lot of sense. In an op-ed in the Arizona Republic Friday, she said many Arizonans on both sides want leaders to focus on common sense solutions, not party doctrine. She writes, that's why I've joined the growing number of Arizonans who reject party politics by declaring my independence from the broken partisan system in Washington. Removing myself from the partisan structure, not only is it true to who I am and how I operate, I also think it'll provide a place of belonging for many folks across the state and the country who also are tired of the partisanship. Her switch from Democrat to independent comes just days after Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock was declared the winner in Georgia. Democrats thought they just picked up a 51 to 49 majority. That includes two independents who caucus with Democrats. So what does cinema switch mean for the power balance in the next Senate? Probably not much. She told Politico she won't caucus with Republicans and nothing will change about her values or behavior. It's unclear if she'll caucus with Democrats. She told CNN she plans to keep her committee assignments. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer controls those for Democrats, so it's a sign Cinema doesn't intend to throw off the power balance. But the switch could put her up for competition from Democrats in 2024, when she's up for re-election. But she told CNN she's not focusing on re-election right now. What I am worried about is continuing to do what's right for my state. And there are folks who certainly don't like my approach. We hear about it a lot, but the proof is in the pudding. Cinema says she'll continue to be an independent voice for Arizona. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Three high-ranking officials in the Biden administration don't have to testify under oath in a case to find out if the government worked with big tech to censor information about the pandemic. One of them will instead send written testimony, partly because it's less intrusive than testifying at a deposition. Back in October, U.S. District Judge Terry Doughty ordered the depositions of three high-ranking Biden administration officials. Those are Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Jen Easterly, and Deputy Assistant to President Biden, Rob Flaherty. That came as part of a lawsuit brought in May by Republican Attorneys General of Missouri and Louisiana. The attorneys general alleged that high-ranking members of the government colluded and coerced social media companies to censor certain information about COVID-19. Because of that, a federal judge ordered Dr. Anthony Fauci, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, and other high-ranking officials to testify under oath at depositions. However, last month, a federal appeals court blocked the move in favor of the three officials, Murthy, Easterly, and Flaherty, stating that the judge had failed to consider less intrusive means to obtain the needed information. So this week, Thursday, Judge Doughty ruled that the three will no longer be required to appear for a deposition. Judge Doughty now ruled that for two of the three, Murthy and Easterly, less high-ranking officials will testify instead. But for Flaherty, the judge says there is no suitable alternative for Flaherty. However, because written discovery will be less intrusive than a deposition, it is authorized that written discovery be served on Flaherty. Saki also tried to avoid testifying. However, Judge Doughty on Thursday ruled that her testimony is crucial. The depositions were scheduled for early December, but Dowdy noted on Thursday that this has been extended to January 13th. The White House has denied claims that it colluded with social media companies to censor free speech on multiple topics, including COVID. 
Arizona gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake indicated she will attempt to take her election-related lawsuit to the U.S. Supreme Court if necessary. In a Twitter post, Lake said she will file a challenge today, again claiming that voters were disenfranchised amid Election Day problems. Arizona officials certified the election for her gubernatorial opponent, Katie Hobbs. In an interview this week with Salem News, Lake said that she could not file a lawsuit because the election has to be certified first. Lake said on Steve Bannon's war room that she'll take the lawsuit all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary and will not stop fighting. Maricopa County officials have acknowledged problems with vote tabulation equipment, but say the issue was later resolved. They deny voters were disenfranchised on Election Day. The Republican Party of Arizona is calling in the chair of the Republican National Committee to resign. They point to RNC leader Ronna McDaniel's alleged failure to support Republican candidates in the midterms as one of the reasons for her to step down. They're also asking other state Republican committees to vote her out at RNC meeting in January. The call for McDaniel to step down comes after GOP lawmakers failed to win control of the Senate, and GOP Senate nominee Herschel Walker just narrowly lost to the Georgia runoff election. McDaniel has been RNC chair since 2017 and plans to run again. She currently has endorsements from enough RNC members potentially to secure a fourth term. Her challengers include 2020 Trump campaign legal advisor Hermit Dillon and MyPillow CEO Mike Lindell. A revealing second installment of the so-called Twitter files was published Thursday evening. It shines a bright light on the secret back blacklisting of conservatives happening at Twitter before the Elon Musk takeover. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the story. Truth brings reconciliation. Those are the words Twitter CEO Elon Musk tweeted after the latest incendiary Twitter files report was released by journalist Barry Weiss. In a series of tweets, Weiss revealed how Twitter employed shadow banning to reduce the visibility of tweets from conservative users. Weiss cited the example of Stanford's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He argued that COVID lockdowns would harm children. Twitter secretly placed him on a trends blacklist which prevented his tweets from trending. She also detailed how popular conservative talk show host Dan Bongino was hit with a search blacklist or how Twitter set the account of conservative activist Charlie Kirk to do not amplify. Weiss wrote that, quote, a new Twitter files investigation reveals that teams of Twitter employees build blacklists, prevent disfavored tweets from trending, and actively limit the visibility of entire accounts or even trending topics, all in secret without informing users. She stated that Twitter had previously denied doing such things, saying, quote, in 2018, Twitter's Vijay Gadi and Kayvon Bakepour said we do not shadow ban, and we certainly don't shadow ban based on political viewpoints or ideology. Weiss says Twitter executives and employees employed a different terminology, describing what they were doing as visibility filtering, or VF. Twitter used VF to block searches of individual users, to limit the scope of a particular tweet's discoverability, to block select users' posts from ever appearing on the trending page, and from inclusion in hashtag searches. Twitter employees told Weiss that Twitter controls visibility quite a bit, and that they control the amplification of people's content, adding that normal people do not know how much they do. Weiss wrote that there was a secret group for more controversial accounts, the Site Integrity Policy Policy Escalation Support, or SIPPES. It included Vijay Gadi, Yul Roth, subsequent CEOs Jack Dorsey, and Parag Agrawal and others. Weiss wrote that that is where the biggest, most politically sensitive decisions got made, and that there would be no ticket or anything for those. One account warranting that level of scrutiny was Libs of TikTok, The account with 1.4 million followers was subjected to six suspensions in 2022 alone. Twitter repeatedly informed account owner Chaya Rechik that she had been suspended for violating Twitter's policy against hateful conduct. However, an internal SIPPES memo acknowledges that libs of TikTok did not violate the hateful conduct policy. It justified the suspensions by claiming her posts encouraged online harassment of hospitals and medical providers by insinuating that gender-affirming health care is equivalent to child abuse or grooming. Weiss wrote that they are just getting started with their reporting. She says that documents cannot tell the whole story here. She says to look out for the next installment and tagged journalist Matt Taibbi. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. 
Musk tweeted yesterday evening that Twitter is working on a software update that will show people's true account status so they know clearly if they've been shadow banned. It will also show the reason why and how to appeal. He added that Twitter would soon start freeing the namespace of 1.5 billion accounts, adding that these are obvious account deletions with no tweets and no login for years. And coming up, BlackRock is back in the spotlight. Arizona has pulled out big money from the investment titan. The state alleges the firm changed from a traditional asset manager into a political force. We have that and more just after this break. Turning now to the controversy surrounding asset managers and the environmental social governance strategy. Arizona is divesting from the world's largest asset manager over this, and the world's largest issuer of mutual funds is pulling out of a group seeking to hit net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Joining us now is Will Hild, Executive Director of Consumers Research. It's a pleasure having you on the show today, Will. It's great to be back with you. The environmental social governance strategy by BlackRock has caused Arizona to pull out about $540 million from the asset management firm. How much of an impact is the state's action against ESG and thus BlackRock and Vanguard really having? Absolutely. Well, as a percentage of BlackRock's assets under management, this, this is a tiny amount. But it's a part of an ongoing pattern. Last week, we saw CFO Jimmy Petronas in Florida remove $2 billion dollars from BlackRock, and that's other states like West Virginia, Arkansas have removed. And so, and these numbers are growing exponentially. So it's gotta be worrying for BlackRock, and it is having an effect in the market. In fact, earlier this year, UBS, the grade stocks, downgraded BlackRock from a buy to a neutral hold, citing the backlash to ESG, that that is going to be a headwind for growth for that company. It could even lead to, to a further decline. Well, you said this could be worrying for BlackRock. Can we expect any actions that they're going to take in response? Well, you know, you've seen uh, the CEO, Larry Fink, start trying to walk back many of the statements that he's made prior. Um, start t- he started talking, you know, very differently than he was three, four years ago when he was, you know, bragging about BlackRock throwing its weight around. So I think you're starting to see a pivot optically, but the issue that they've got is that BlackRock has made so many promises to the far left progressive left about the ways in which they will use their assets to push a political agenda that now he's getting hit from the left as well for for going back on his promises. Now, these are things he shouldn't be doing and should have never promised to do in the first place. So uh, I don't want him to to fulfill those promises, but but it is telling he has now put himself in in a very tough position and put that company in a very difficult position. It's interesting you mentioned the optics surrounding BlackRock. Now, Vanguard said it's pulling out of the net zero asset managers initiative, while also saying that the change will not prevent them from helping investors navigate the risks that climate change may pose to their returns. So what is your reaction to this? Well, this seems to be clearly a response to our filing two weeks ago before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that asked FERC to stop renewing Vanguard's ability to hold and buy large portions of publicly traded utilities because they're not a passive investor. And that was the argument that that, that they had used for that authorization. And this seems to be a response to that. They're saying, you know, they're basically backing out. They're saying we're not going to be pushing net zero targets at the companies where we where we hold large amounts of of the stock. Uh, And and their statement is at least suggests that they are going to restrict their net zero targeting activities to funds that are explicitly ESG. Part of the problem with many of these asset managers is they have explicit ESG funds for people who want to opt into that kind of thing. But then in reality, they were using their entire stock portfolio, people who are just invested in vanilla investments like an S&P 500 index fund. Those assets were being used to push a political agenda. It's because they are using assets from, from funds that are not labeled ESG. If you buy the iShares, the BlackRock one, Larry Fink is using your assets to push ESG targets, even though you didn't opt into that. So that sometimes they'll, they'll weasel out when they're within their announcements and they're like, oh, we only have like five ESG funds. We don't really do ESG. But then you look at what they say they do with all of their investments and it's net zero targets, pushing social progressivism. It would seem that Vanguard is now retreating from that position. We will be keeping an eye on that and making sure that they follow through. And if they if they won't, we will be we'll be after them. Definitely. We'll keep a close eye on this. Executive Director of Consumers Research, Will Hild, thank you so much for your analysis today. 
Thank you so much for having me. BlackRock did not immediately respond to a request for comment on claims it's using non-ESG funds for ESG purposes. For well over half a century, he was only known as the boy in the box. But on Thursday, Philadelphia police publicly identified a child killed 65 years ago as four-year-old Joseph Augustus Zarelli. He was found dead, wrapped in a blanket inside a cardboard box in a wooded area of northeast Philadelphia in February 1957. He had scars on his body, weighed just 30 pounds, and appeared malnourished. The case is one of Philadelphia's oldest unsolved homicides. Investigators identified little Joseph using DNA analysis. It's the biggest break yet in the case, but investigators say there's a lot more work to do. The death certificate for the unknown child, OME number 57-0863, would be amended to reflect the child's birth name, Joseph Augustus Zarelli. Joseph's date of birth is January 13th, 1953. This is still an active homicide investigation, and we still need the public's help in filling in this child's life story. There is a $20,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the case. Authorities pulled an escaped inmate on the run and his fugitive girlfriend from a burning home in Nevada early Wednesday morning. Angelo Atencio escaped from the Lesson County Jail in California on Saturday. Authorities learned he was holed up with his girlfriend, Ashley Ward, at this home. Ward is alleged to have helped him break out of jail. An hours-long standoff ensued with Atencio saying he took Ward hostage. Eventually, authorities saw fire burning on the top floor and it fully engulfed the house. The five-person search team rushed into the house and rescued Ward, then returned and brought out Atencio. The pair were in the basement. The Humble County Sheriff praised them for acting heroically and unselfishly to save the lives of the two suspects. Atencio and Ward were arrested and booked for being fugitives from justice in another state. Atencio was also booked for false imprisonment, kidnapping, arson, and first-degree attempted murder. Authorities plan to restore a river that crosses from Oregon to California. That means four dams along the river will have to go. Officials from the two states, as well as Native American tribes and the federal government, stood atop one of the dams to celebrate. Native American tribes and environmentalists have been championing the plan for California's second largest river, the Klamath, for years. The project would return the lower half to a free-flowing state for the first time in more than a century. And the dam demolition will open up hundreds of miles of salmon habitat. It's set to be the largest dam removal and river restoration project in the world when it goes forward. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission voted on Thursday to approve the plan. That was the last major regulatory hurdle for the $500 million proposal. Apple is no longer launching a controversial tool that would have checked iOS devices and the iCloud for child sexual abuse material. The tech giant first announced the feature in 2021, but the proposal received a wave of criticism for potential privacy implications. Instead, Apple is now planning to refocus its efforts on its communication safety feature. That tool allows opt-in parental controls to warn minors and their parents if an incoming image message is sexually explicit. And still to come, the Canadian government is suspending a contract with a company partly owned by the Chinese Communist regime. Canada's Prime Minister calls the deal disconcerting. And UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk says he's very determined to follow up on China's Xinjiang issue. This follows his predecessor's report in August. We'll have the details when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable. Our government is in shambles. And the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals 
Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Welcome back. UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk says he will engage with Beijing on issues related to China's Xinjiang region. This follows an August report by his predecessor revealing the Chinese regime's treatment of Uyghurs and other Muslims. The, the report that, that was issued on the 31st of, of August is, an, is a very important one. It has highlighted very serious human rights concerns. And my focus is on following up on the recommendations that are contained in the report. And I will personally continue engaging with, with the authorities. Um, and, you know, I believe in, I'm very determined to do so. Turk is talking on the challenge of dealing with the human rights record of China, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Beijing pressured his predecessor, Michelle Bachelet, not to publish the report, and she only did so in the final minutes of her term. Her report highlights allegations of torture or ill treatment by the Chinese Communist Party, including forced medical treatment and harsh conditions in detention. It dubs Beijing's actions a violation of international laws. The Chinese regime threatened to close the door on cooperation with the UN Human Rights Office after the report's release. Republican House Leader Kevin McCarthy names a leader for a committee aimed at tackling China. McCarthy plans to create the committee if he is elected House Speaker in January. McCarthy called on Congressman Mike Gallagher to lead the committee. Gallagher is an ex-Marine counterintelligence officer. He has served on the House Armed Services Committee and has been vocal about his criticism of the Chinese regime. In announcing the selection of Gallagher, McCarthy said, quote, The Chinese Communist Party is the greatest geopolitical threat of our lifetime. McCarthy said the committee would investigate China's role in the fentanyl trade, Chinese Communist influence in U.S. academic institutions, and Chinese lobbying efforts in U.S. state and local government, among other things. In Canada, the federal government is suspending a contract with a company that is partly owned by the Chinese regime. This follows a recent investigation that discovered the contract. Here's the story. Canada's public safety minister confirmed Thursday that the Federal Royal Canadian Mount Police, or RCMP, have suspended a contract with a company linked to the Chinese regime. Radio Canada reported on Wednesday that the federal government had awarded a contract worth about 400,000 U.S. dollars to Sinclair Technology in 2021. The company is responsible for making a radio frequency filtering system, which the RCMP was going to use to protect radio communications from eavesdropping. Sinclair Technology is a company based in Ontario, Canada. Its parent company is Norset International, which is based in British Columbia, Canada. Norset has been owned by Chinese telecom company Hytera Communications since 2017. And the Chinese regime owns around 9% of Hytera. Hytera equipment is banned in the U.S. on national security grounds. The company also faces several espionage charges in the U.S. After the report came out on Wednesday, the Canadian government ordered an investigation. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about the contract during a press conference and said he finds it disconcerting. Trudeau said Wednesday morning that his government will look into the matter and will examine the role security plays in government procurement. Radio Canada says in the report that a contract with Sinclair was $60,000 less than the bid of its competitor. The government agency responsible for the contract reportedly told Radio Canada that they didn't consider security concerns or Sinclair's ownership during the bidding process. Reporting by Alison Lee and Xu Wenrong, NTD News. Turning to a $100 million online investment scam, Australian police have charged four Chinese nationals living in Sydney for the scam. It mainly targeted people in the U.S., but it also caused losses around the world. It was the U.S. Secret Service who tipped off the Australian authorities. The organized crime syndicate used messaging platforms as well as dating and job websites to gain victims' trust before mentioning investment opportunities. An Australian police detective says the case is a reminder not to invest 
invest in, quote, foreign exchange, cryptocurrency, or speculative investments with people you've only ever encountered in the online environment. Police say the four arrested men registered Australian companies to make their scams look genuine and created Australian business bank accounts to launder the proceeds. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, although Turkey is still mulling over some questions, the U.S. believes they will be resolved and Finland and Sweden will become NATO allies. And Russia faces increasing economic pain in 2023 as the war in Ukraine grinds on. Sanctions and isolation continue to affect normal economic life there. More shortly, here on NTD News Today. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he's confident Finland and Sweden will become NATO allies. This despite Turkey remaining concerned by alleged activities of Kurdish militant groups inside Finland. Like uh, every ally, we have um, uh, a strong stake in the membership process being completed and uh, both countries formally joining the alliance. Uh, We know the contributions that they can make. Um, And those contributions could not be uh, more important at a time when we have uh, a variety of challenges. Sweden and Finland abandoned their long-standing policies of military non-alignment. They applied for NATO membership after Russian forces invaded Ukraine in February amid concerns that Moscow might target them next. However, NATO member Turkey has been holding up their bids to join the alliance. It accuses the two Nordic countries of ignoring threats to Turkey from Kurdish militants and other groups it considers as terrorists. It has been pressing the two countries to crack down on these groups. The parliaments of Turkey and Hungary have yet to ratify their applications. The 28 other NATO states have already done so. All member states must do so for Finland and Sweden to become NATO members. Croatia won approval yesterday to join Europe's open travel zone called Schengen. But Bulgaria and Romania were denied because of opposition led by Austria. Here's the president of the Council of the European Union. A big congratulations to to Croatia, to our new Schengen member. Uh, It has been from the very beginning of our presidency, one of our highest, biggest priorities. I think it's very clear that when we are united in the European Union, we are so strong. We can achieve so much. The Schengen area is the world's largest free travel zone. It abolishes border checks between member states and is one of the top achievements of European integration. Croatia will become its 27th member starting next year. All members must unanimously agree to let a new country join. But Austria would not grant Romania and Bulgaria that support due to immigration concerns. Officials say Austria recorded 100,000 illegal border crossings so far this year. That includes 75,000 people who had not been previously registered in other Schengen countries as they should have been. Immigration has been a hot-button issue in Europe since 2015. That's when more than a million people arrived from across the Mediterranean Sea, mostly on smugglers' boats. The influx prompted the EU to tighten its borders and asylum laws. A new pipeline promises to connect Spain and France in the energy sector. The Portuguese prime minister said that this underwater corridor will be used solely to transport green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is a fuel made from water that produces no emissions, but it's unstable and costs a lot of energy to transport. Leaders from Portugal, Spain, France, and the European Commission gathered to discuss the pipeline. The entire project could cost about $2.6 billion, with an EU fund paying for about half of that. Upon completion, it will be able to ship more than 2 million tons of the fuel per year. But analysts also believe the pipeline is unlikely to ease Europe's energy crisis in the near future, as it may not be up and running until 2030. Japan, Britain, and Italy are merging their next-generation fighter jet projects. It's a groundbreaking partnership spanning Europe and Asia and Japan's first major defense collaboration beyond the United States since World War II. 
In a statement today, the three countries said the deal aims to put an advanced frontline fighter into operation by 2035. It's a venture called the Global Combat Air Program. The project comes amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine and growing Chinese military activity around Japan and Taiwan. The agreement may help Japan counter the growing military might of its bigger neighbor and give Britain a bigger security role in the region. The United States also welcomed the joint Europe-Japan agreement. It's already pledged to defend all three countries through its membership in NATO and a separate security pact with Japan. Russian President Putin is paying up to keep his campaign in Ukraine grinding on. Analysts say managing the fallout at home and abroad is likely to become ever harder in 2023. Despite U.S. intelligence warnings, many European and Ukrainian officials didn't believe Russia would invade. Their logic? It would be irrational of President Vladimir Putin and far too much for his army to bite off. Nonetheless, Putin, incensed by what he saw as Ukraine's westwards pivot, ordered his, quote, special military operation. Russia's invasion of Ukraine upended geopolitics. NATO expansion was the very thing Putin opposed. Now the alliance is poised to add Finland and Sweden. Previously, Ukraine struggled to get the West interested in its conflict with Russia, but it's now receiving unimaginable international support. The U.S. is providing the lion's share of the financial and military aid required to keep Ukraine in the fight. Meanwhile, harsh sanctions are shrinking Russia's role as one of the world's big energy and commodity producers. Even a temporary ceasefire is looking hard to achieve. Ukraine insists Russia must withdraw from all its territory, including Crimea, before any peace talks happen. Russia can expect more Western attempts at isolation in 2023, including of Putin personally. Iran, North Korea and Belarus remain staunch supporters, and China and India are buying heavily discounted Russian oil. But Beijing hasn't been as publicly supportive as expected. Moscow will also have to manage its sanctions-hit economy, while potentially slashing funding for services. As Russia continues its war in Ukraine, Russian civilians are signing up to learn military skills. In a sports club just outside Moscow, a former Russian Special Forces captain is training them to use automatic rifles. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details on their instruction. The United States and its Western allies have condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But some Russians see the conflict differently. Putin describes the war as defending Russians in Ukraine and ties it to Russia's reputation following the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, some civilians are seeking out urban warfare training. Here, as you saw, we are doing urban military training, which for us civilians who have not served in the army could be a very useful skill. God forbid we need to defend our city homes or if we need to be sent to the front to defend our motherland. There are questions about the accuracy of wartime polling. Some surveys show that a clear majority of Russians support the war in Ukraine. But many younger, urban Russians are far less supportive and have little confidence in state television. I'd rather not talk about politics. Everybody has their own opinion. I'm just interested in broadening my experience. And if it so happens that my boyfriend will be sent to the front line, I will go with him. Maybe they won't give me an automatic rifle, but I can go as a medical worker, as a volunteer. In a city just north of Moscow, a club teaches civilians how to hold Kalashnikov AK-47s and AK-103s and how to fight in combat. You know, we are not playing with toys here. By no means do we consider it, like the video game, Counter-Strike. There is just one reason. When the dark storm clouds gather over Russia, the Russian people unite. It's not that much linked to the current situation. I'm talking more generally. Such classes used to be taught back during Soviet times to explain the basics to people. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of Russians have fled the country to avoid being called up to serve in Ukraine. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Just ahead, as prices rise, tree growers in the United Kingdom want to make sure people still feel the holiday magic. They're keeping Christmas tree prices low or discounted. 
But over in Hungary, pig farmers are struggling as they deal with the price of pig feed, drought, and veterinary costs. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Good to have you back with us. Many countries are considering central bank digital currencies, but given how companies like PayPal and countries like Canada have frozen people's access to the access to people's money, a state-owned digital currency raises concerns. That's about a China-style social credit system being used in the West. More on this from NTD's Malcolm Hudson. The Bank of England is considering whether to establish a central bank digital currency, also known as CBDCs. They are similar to digital money like Bitcoin, but are issued by central banks. But there are concerns surrounding CBDCs. Alan Miller, co-founder of the Together Association, told me it's becoming increasingly difficult to pay for things using physical cash. Why is that a question and why that, is that an issue? Well, if money is going to be programmable, if there's going to be a central bank digital currency and the ability for um, you know, surveillance, and controls increases. That's a concern. Miller said Canadian truckers had their bank accounts frozen after they protested against the government earlier this year. And the founder of the free speech union, Toby Young, had his PayPal accounts frozen without any clear explanation as to why. Cameron Parry, founder and CEO of Tally Money, said it blows his mind that companies can turn off people's access to their own money. With central bank digital currencies, um, yeah, that could be done at government level. You know, by, by a, a civil servant, it's, it's not like the person you're democratically electing. It would be somebody who would have the power to do that who's, you know, behind the scenes. Digital money needs to be tracked to account for transfers. So a level of surveillance is necessary. A question in the conversation is, how much surveillance should we have? Some, like Andrew Lowenthal, say this topic is usually only associated with the political right. Yes, so I think one of the big problems in this space is that it's associated mostly with the right. And then actually a lot of these issues, digital ID, central bank digital currencies, etc., are issues that progressives should be very deeply concerned about. The tracking and the tracing, etc., um, of your political life should be something that everyone, regardless of your political orientation, should be concerned about. But James Melville, managing director of East Points West, said he comes from the centre left. I think it's really good for people to share ideas. I've got no time for people who look at someone with a different opinion and go, you're wrong, and then hurl abuse at them. What I want is people to go, I think you're wrong, but I'm going to listen to you. I want to hear your ideas. And then I'm going to go away and think about it and we're going to debate and we're going to share ideas and maybe learn a thing or two from each other as well. Conversations like this flesh out ideas and can also influence policy. Many here hope physical cash will be preserved. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. In the UK, Royal Mail staff rallied today near the Houses of Parliament in central London. Members of the group have started waves of strikes in the run-up to Christmas. 
Thousands of postal workers walked out over wages and conditions. The situation could spell trouble for holiday deliveries. Wages for almost all British workers are lagging behind consumer price inflation. Inflation in October reached a four-decade high of 11 percent. The shortfall is particularly big in the public sector, where pay rose by only about 2 percent annually in the three months ending in September. Amid a cost-of-living crisis, U.K. tree growers hope Christmas trees can add a touch of magic and normalcy to the holiday season. And they're offering savings to customers by cutting prices and selling cheaper trees. Let's take a look. Nestled on a hillside in East Herefordshire, hundreds of Christmas trees are ready to be harvested. It's the busiest time of the year for Christmas tree growers like Colin Palmer. While being the first Christmas without COVID-19 restrictions, Christmas 2022 is going to be under the shadow of the cost of living crisis. Palmer says there are pine trees to suit all budgets. If people want the more fashionable northern firs, they're much more difficult to grow um, and we do have to charge more for them. So so anyone on a limited budget, then the Norway spruce is ideal uh, really for, for, for a purchase. Nordman firs start at £30, while Norway spruce trees start at just £15. They're fast growing. This, this fellow is probably oh, six years old um, and it's already two metres, over two metres tall um, and very easy to grow. Um, um, so this we can sell really um, at a very low, low cost. At this small churchyard in the hustle and bustle of London, the festive season has begun for tree sellers supplying homes across the capital. They also have value trees for customers on a budget this year. So obviously the cost of living is hurting us all right now. So the first thing that we did was drop our tree prices. Uh, We also significantly dropped our value Norman tree prices. Prices at the shop in Primrose Hill range from £19 for a small value Norman tree to £270 for a 12-foot indoor Fraser Noble tree. Trees, like humans, are not homogenous, so they will not all come out perfectly symmetrical like those Disney-style trees. So the trees that are value trees or assigned to be a value tree are the ones that tend to be a little bit wonkier as they grow, but they're still perfectly good and we still want to try and find them a home for Christmas. Tree growers hope a beautifully decorated tree in the home can provide some normality in difficult times. French ski resorts are looking for ways to reduce their energy bills and other costs amid soaring electricity prices. They're raising lift prices, making ski lifts run slower, and reducing snow production. Snow forecasts are good, but ski resorts in the French Alps are worried about this season and next. They are scrambling to find ways to keep their energy bills in check amid record high inflation. Half of France ski resorts have had to renegotiate their long-term electricity contracts and they expect an annual bill that could increase up to sixfold next year. The ski resorts of Val Torrens, which opened its doors last week, is among the lucky ones. It was able to secure a contract before the energy crunch for most of next year. But it now needs a solution for the next skiing season. We are mountain people. Our motto is that we always get out of difficult situations, and it will be the case this time again, because we will adapt. To meet demands by the government to lessen energy use, most resorts plan to reduce the speed of the ski lifts. For instance, if there is no crowd and the wait is under five minutes, the speed will reduce by 10%. And if the power operator sends an alert saying there's too much demand on the grid, it will be brought down by 30%. Val Torrens and other resorts have also pledged not to produce artificial snow when national energy consumption is high. The resort at 2,500 metres above sea level has increased its lift tickets by up to 9%. The Director of Tourism Office said they don't think it will affect their booking rate. They expect to be 80% full at the end of the season. Hungary's traditional pig breeders are struggling to keep the lights on amid drought and inflation. Their fight comes as Eastern European consumers battle food price inflation that outpaces the wider European Union. These are Hungary's traditional hairy Mangalisa pigs, prized for their meat. Their breeders are struggling to stay in business after a punishing combination of drought and inflation. Feed prices have nearly doubled from 2021. 
The cost of energy and medical care for the animals has skyrocketed too. Lyosh Condor's family rears more than 2,000 pigs in the east. He's hiked prices by as much as 25 percent, but doesn't think customers can bear much more than that. Businesses will have to swallow some of these costs to be able to bridge this situation, he says. Condor isn't alone and others simply won't survive, according to the head of the country's breeding association. It's just one example in a country where food prices spiked more than 45 percent in October compared to a year ago. That's according to Eurostat data. Food prices are the main driver of inflation in Hungary, and surging prices mean families are buying less. The cost of meat and fish is up more than 34 percent year on year. That means 75-year-old Eva Ratz can't buy the carp she wanted for the holidays. She has medicine and utilities to think about first. There are some people for whom Christmas will be nice. And for some, if I'm frank, it will not be, she says. Hungary is among 10 countries in the east of the European Union facing food price inflation beyond 20 percent. And there's no sign inflation is slowing down yet. Thursday's data is expected to show it accelerating to more than 22 percent in November. Hungary's national bank governor said inflation would average up to 18 percent next year, with food accounting for more than 50 percent of further rises. Benjamin Netanyahu has formally asked Israel's president for more time to form the next government. Netanyahu was given the first opportunity to form a government after the November 1st elections. That gave him and his allies a majority of seats in Israel's parliament, the Knesset. By law, he had 28 days after receiving the mandate on November 13th to form a coalition government. But he wrote a letter to President Isaac Herzog on Thursday evening. He said negotiations with his coalition partners are almost done, but he needs an extra two weeks to finish hammering out complex issues of principle. Among the issues to be settled are further ministerial roles and legislation that needs to be passed so political allies with criminal convictions will be allowed to serve as ministers. Herzog is expected to grant the two-week extension. That would give Netanyahu until December 25th. And coming up, two walruses, a brother and sister from Canada, have made their home at a Washington zoo. And a handwritten score from a 17-year-old Mozart is up for auction in London. Along with it, a rare military letter from King Henry VIII. Details to come on NTD News Today. A crowd of nearly 2,000 people braved the bitter cold winter temperatures in Chicago suburb last night. They were eager to see the Christmas-themed Canadian Pacific holiday train pass through. I was so emotional. I was like, oh my God, it finally came. Because I don't feel the cold that much. And it's worth it because it's so cool. The enthusiastic second grader was among the many children on hand. He was a train was lit up with images of Santa Claus, elves, and other symbols of Yuletide cheer. It travels across Canada and the United States, spreading holiday cheer and raising funds for local food banks in the communities. It stops in Thursdays, help raise $7,500 for the Northern Illinois Food Bank. It's that time of year, the chance to share indulgent holiday treats. Wise Voter dug up some data on America's favorite Christmas treats and found this year will be a cheesy one. The results show a majority of U.S. states favor cheesecake as their top Christmas treat, followed by sugar cookies. Montana and North Dakota are unique in choosing cinnamon rolls as their preferred Christmas treat, while Alaska, North Carolina, and Oregon went with a sweet drink instead with eggnog as their top pick. Hot chocolate is a top favorite across the country as well, making the list for most states in their top five favorites. After an international trip from Canada's Quebec, two teenage walruses have resettled at a zoo in Tacoma, Washington. Zookeepers are coming to grips with their new friends. Let's take a look. Roar. Good. Sputter. Good. Click. Good. Growl. Good boy. Hum. Good job, buddy. Sing. Good job, buddy. This is assistant curator Sheridan Plouffe feeding Balzac, a six-year-old male walrus, and his sister, Lakina. The siblings are new visitors to the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. In human terms, both are in adolescence. They're both different, and they uh, react to training sessions differently. They learn differently. She's a little more uh, quick. Uh, to pick things up, and he takes his time to learn. 
Throughout the United States, only 14 walruses are under human care. So walruses are considered vulnerable, but they're not listed as endangered. They are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act in the United States. Walruses seek food and shelter on floating ice floes. But with melting ice, these animals are swimming to land for food. They're really sensitive to human disturbances like loud noise or planes flying overhead. That causes them to stampede. And when they stampede, that's when they can get injured and calves can get separated from their parents. Balzac and Lakina are in training to follow their new keeper's commands in both French and English. <laughs> to match their exercise level, their diet may seem a bit lavish. These are restaurant quality mussels. <laughs> Six months supply of seafood is on hand for them, all frozen at minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. We go through about 16,000 pounds of clam uh, a year just for walruses alone. It's a lot of clam. <laughs> a team of vets check on them regularly to keep them in optimal health. Oh my goodness. Are you ready for your exam? Open. Walruses living in captivity enjoy a dental benefit not available to those in the wild. Their tusks lack enamel or have very little enamel, so it makes them prone to developing wear very easily. And because they can get wear on them, they can get an infection, and so we want to make sure we protect the ends of the tusks. And this happens with wild walrus as well. They just don't have the dentist to put on their caps. Walruses make a special noise underwater. It's a call for breeding. Once the two become of breeding age, their future may take them elsewhere to meet suitable partners. Christie's London will hold an auction next week of valuable books and manuscripts. A high-profile item include a military letter from King Henry VIII and a sheet of music handwritten by Mozart at the age of 17. So this is a letter by King Henry VIII uh, written in July 1530. Um, it's signed at the top of the letter, Henry R, and the rest of the letter is in the hand of a scribe um, who will be encamped with Henry in his first invasion of France. We are also offering an autographed manuscript in the hand of Mozart. Um, and the extraordinary thing about any autographed manuscript really is the, is the power it retains over us to present the human behind the reputation of some of the world's most important historical figures. In this rare war letter, Henry reveals his strategy for the battle. He calls on his lieutenant to occupy a town in northern France and to recruit German mercenaries to fight for the English. The letter was valued at thirty to forty thousand dollars, and Mozart's manuscript was written to celebrate a family friend's college graduation. It features the opening fifteen bars of the second movement of the Serenade in D major for orchestra. It has a price tag of over one hundred thousand dollars. Other auction highlights include a personal letter from composer Felix Mendelssohn, among others. We have another interesting piece of historical news. Archaeologists found a human-sized sculpture at an archaeological site in Mexico's southern Yucatan state. They say the limestone sculpture represents a male figure, probably a warrior prisoner, offered in a ritual. The archaeologists at Mexico's National Institute of Archaeology and History found the statue in a building that's under restoration. They also found engravings and inscriptions on the walls and steps of the structure. According to the Yucatan Times, the archaeological site is a Mayan site from before Columbus that was abandoned in the 1500s. Its name means the City of the Three Cutting Suns. The project director says the statue represents many ideas belonging to Mayan cosmology. A restorer says the engravings provide information about dates, characters, and place names of the Mayan age. Researchers in the UK have established a link between everyday encounters with birds and improved mental well-being. Let's look at how bird watching can improve our health. Here's Gina Marie with Strong Mind and Body. Many Americans are searching for new ways to improve their mental health. There are many options from online counseling and therapy to wellness apps to fitness trackers. However, according to new research from the UK's King's College London, there may be an easier option. You can boost your mood by spending time around birds and listening to their songs. 
The data for the study was collected using a smartphone application. It was collected in real time as users reported their mood after a series of questions. Nearly 1,300 participants from different countries joined in. They reported that interacting with wild birds during their daily life caused a boost in their moods. The study took place between 2018 and 2021. Participants were actively tracking their mood during the COVID-19 pandemic. They revealed that birdsong in particular was associated with relief of psychological stress. It also relieved attentional fatigue. They concluded that experiencing bird life was beneficial to those who had been previously diagnosed with depression. According to the study's authors, depression is currently the most common mental health illness throughout the world. It is also the leading cause of disability and sick leave globally. Researchers pointed out that listening and interacting with birds is a multi-sensory experience. One upside of these findings is the relative popularity of birdwatching in the United States and the United Kingdom. According to the authors of the study, over 70 million Americans report being interested in birdwatching. This latest research is just part of a larger body of work that is showing the relationship between mental well-being and nature. Previous studies have examined how green spaces and blue spaces can combat negative moods. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.